midsummer in Norway, days when the sun never really sets. A natural wonder north of the Arctic Circle. A brief respite before the long winter. Untouched nature. And people celebrating the Arctic summer. Northern Norway, barren, rough, and mysterious. Summer, a brief glow of this rugged beauty north of the Arctic Circle. Norway is about the size of Germany and one of the largest countries in Europe. But only about 5.3 million people live here. The capital is Oslo. Bordeaux is the first major city north of the Arctic Circle and gateway to the Lofoten archipelago. Lofoten translates to Lynx Foot, a chain of about 80 islands in the North Atlantic. Foothills of the Gulf Stream provide a mild climate. Even in midsummer, the thermometer rarely climbs above 20 degrees centigrade. That means wetsuit instead of bikini for Tamara Singer and Angelita Eriksson. Life over there. Yeah. Uh, it might be better over there because of the wind yeah. and the, this weather system, so yeah. it will be more protected. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should good. head over there. Yeah, okay. Let's go. The Norwegian and the New Zealander have an unusual idea. In Lufoten, which feels like the end of the world, they harvest and process seaweed, which grows abundantly on the coast. Their common language is English. Angelita grew up as the daughter of a fisherman. Tamara's mother is Japanese and introduced her to seaweed cooking at an early age. This is maybe the most famous seaweed type because it is actually naughty, which is used around the sushi rolls. This is our Lofoten version, but when you taste it, um, you get the same taste that you get when you're eating sushi. Yeah. Of course, the colour is a little bit different here. One of the reasons is because it's the middle of summer. In the, um, in the winter, this is a deep, dark purple colour. Um, but in the summer, it changes, especially here in Lofoten, when we have so much light. At first glance, it takes some getting used to. But if you know your way around algae like Angelita does, you'll discover real treasures in the sea. Here we have ocean truffle or truffle seaweed. And believe it or not, it tastes just like a truffle. And it's amazing uh, in a uh, salt as well. So I use this quite a lot. But eating it fresh is really yummy. In Japan and China, seaweed has a permanent place on the menu. In Europe too, there are coastal regions in Wales or Iceland where they are consumed. In Norway, the Vikings are said to have packed dried seaweed as provisions, but that was a long time ago. Angelita and Tamara want to re-establish seaweed as a healthy superfood. The conditions are good. The waters of the North Atlantic are rich in nutrients and very clean. Seaweed that grows here can be eaten without hesitation. I had no idea about kelp other than playing on the stones as a kid. 
It wasn't until I was an adult that I became interested. I started reading about it because I was interested in pure and nutritious food. That's when a whole new world of taste opened up to me. It's like a vegetable garden in the sea. Angelita's idea with the algae convinces Tamara. She even willingly went to the other end of the world for it. I grew up in New Zealand um, and we have much longer and warmer summers, especially in the northern part of New Zealand. It has been a surprise for me to be uh, living here in the Arctic um, and also with the light conditions because of course in the winter we have the, the darkness and in the summer we have light 24 hours a day. Seaweed harvest at 10 degrees water temperature. High summer on Lufuten. More than 230,000 islands line Norway's coast. Many of them are uninhabited. Brenvik Sanden on the mainland is one of the most beautiful beaches in the municipality of Steigen. The area around the large bay is protected. Bathing is nevertheless allowed. The dune landscape, with its typical vegetation, was placed under protection in 2002. Bordeaux is the capital of the Nordland province and has one of the most spectacular golf courses in Norway. Surrounded by mountains right by the sea, the green invites you to play under the midnight sun in the summer. In the summer season, Mikael Holtistensrud works here as a golf instructor. Just stand here and then aim at the red flagpole. Very good. You have to make sure that the shoulders stay on one line. I spend a lot of time here on the course. It's nice to meet a lot of people and train. Playing on a course like this here, it's meditation. Fantastic, just being in nature. Mikael is actually an aircraft mechanic. He spends the five-month season on the golf course. There, he mostly meets beginners. The balance may well be 50-50. Good, that way you also come down the hill. Playing golf can be dangerous if you lose control of the ball. If you hit it poorly and it flies somewhere you can't see, that's when you yell four. When you hear four on a golf course, you have to take cover and protect your net. Playing 18 holes, you walk a good 10 kilometers. Golf is actually very calm. Your pulse remains low, very focused and concentrated. It's more of a precision sport than a conditioned sport. You have to be very focused when you play golf and concentrate on your swing. Everything is very calm and you have a lot of time to do what you're supposed to do. After work, Mikael likes to stay on the course to hit a few balls and enjoy nature. The light of the midnight sun enchants the landscape. Mm. 
We don't always have such super weather here in the north, but when the weather is like this, it's very popular to play some golf in the middle of the night. Then you start at 9 or 10 in the evening and play all night. It's fantastic. Midnight sun, a day that never ends. The Lufuten Island chain can be seen from the mainland. The locals call it the lower jaw of God. Time seems to stand still on these bright nights. The reason why it doesn't get dark, the Earth rotates on an inclined axis. In summer, the North Pole faces the Sun. The closer to the pole, the longer you can see it shine. The Sami people live in the mountains of Norwegian Finnmark. Summer is traditionally the time when they round up their reindeer herds to mark the young. Up here, spring starts late. Only in May, the last snow melts in the valley. A wild, natural landscape and the most sparsely populated region in Norway. It wasn't until the 18th century that people from other parts of the country came to settle permanently. It was here, of all places, that the German Björn Klauer went. Normally, these huskies pull a sled. In the summer, they are trained with a light wagon. The husky farm is located in Inset, a small town near the border with Sweden. Most of the dogs in the pack are so-called Greenland Huskies, one of the oldest dog breeds in the world, traditionally used as hunting and sled dogs. So, yes, Every evening is feeding time. I've got 83 dogs here. All have their names, of course, but it's not enough to know the name. You also have to know the character. You have to know who can run with whom, who runs best in front of the sled, who prefers to run behind. The husky teams must always be very homogenous. They have to work as a group, and that's why you really have to know every single dog and also the relationships among the dogs. Björn produces the concentrated feed for the dogs himself from slaughterhouse waste. He feeds 30 tons a year. Baras, now it's finally your turn. You had to wait so long, but I think it was worth it. With 83 dogs, it's hard to spoil them all equally. All dogs are very different. Some dogs make a special effort and then you have a closer relationship with them. And here, Weigand is the one without whom nothing would move on the sled. He's someone who pulls very hard and, as a reward, is allowed to lick it out. Björn's son Morten grew up on the husky farm. After his studies in Oslo, he decided to return to Inset and to work together with his father. Offspring is expected at the husky farm. The birth of puppies is an event every time. Dog Tuna is separated from the other dogs so that she can have her cubs in peace. Yes, it can't take much longer. 
Look how tense the belly is. When you press here, the milk comes out. So far, everything is fine. When you feel the belly, you sometimes feel that there is something pressing from the inside. So there are puppies in there, and they certainly want to come out now. All right, Tuna. Tuna, you'll have your last meal before the birth now. Everyone is excited about the new litter. Hopefully, everything will go well. From Finnmark, back to the coast. Vesteröhlen is a group of islands northeast of Lufoten. Whales pass by here all year round. Orcas benefit from the abundance of fish in the sea. Humpback whales also spent the summer in these Arctic waters. Surfing comes from Hawaii, but the surfers on Lufoten have fun too, despite water temperatures around 8 degrees. Surfing in the Arctic, that's summer for the tough ones. The temperature is all right. With a wetsuit, it's not really cold. It's quite wonderful. You just feel that it's cold. That's all right. Surfing in the Arctic. Completely different to surfing on Hawaii. The Lufoten Islands are surrounded by strong ocean currents. They arise because the water is pushed between the islands at low tide and high tide and thus reaches a high flow velocity. It depends on the tides when and where Angelita and Tamara can harvest their seaweed. We're harvesting in one of the strongest tidal currents in the world. Uh, knowing the weather, uh, learning from my dad who's a fisherman uh, about all the little local changes and um, being safe, uh, harvesting, it's been really, really important. Yeah. yeah. Algae also grow in aquacultures, but Tamara and Angelita prefer to harvest right in the sea and only take small amounts. The algae grow back on their own. This is called sugar kelp. It's a seaweed that is really commonly um, used also in Japan. It's called kombu in Japanese. If you use it in a soup stock, then you can get the umami flavour out of it. Umami comes from Japanese and means tasty spicy. To benefit from this flavour, Tamara and Angelita still have to process the sugar kelp. Geologically, the Lufoten Islands are among the oldest mountain ranges in the world. Without the warm Gulf Stream, they would probably be covered with ice. A precise weather forecast for Lufoten? Almost impossible. People here often experience four seasons in one day. This landscape is fascinating in any weather. Already the Vikings called it Island of the Gods. Traces of first settlement of the archipelago can already be found in the Stone Age. Later, the Vikings founded large chiefdoms here. The island of Vestvergöy has already been densely populated even before that. There is land for growing grain and enough grazing land for the animal companions of the people. Sheep, along with goats, are considered the oldest domestic animals of man.
In 2013, Ragnhild Lee took over a small farm in Stamsund on Vestvergoy. The initial six sheep have now become a small flock. They are quite shy, but also incredibly friendly. All of them have a name. This one is Fifi. She is very smart and likes to be cosy and then come very close to me. You get into good contact with them when you spend some time with them. You also have to speak the language of the sheep. When I greet them with my nose like this, they can smell whether I'm dangerous or not. The breed is called Gammelnorsk sow, old Norwegian sheep. Until the 19th century, it was very common. Later, breeds were imported from England. Gammelnorsk sheep almost went extinct. It is perfectly adapted to the climatic conditions of the polar region. When you look at the DNA of these sheep, it's not much different to bone finds from the Viking age. So we know that the Vikings had sheep like these. No, oh, he didn't like me stroking his back. He's very strong. So the Vikings had almost the same sheep, the same horns and the same wool. Sheep's wool used to be an essential raw material for survival. Without it, people wouldn't have been able to protect themselves against the cold. Even the sails of the Vikings were woven from it. During her textile design studies, Ragnhild realized that there was hardly any wool from Norway left. Australia and China are the biggest exporters. In Europe, Production is hardly worth it anymore. Ragnhild started producing wool in Lofoten. The harsh climate here doesn't bother the sheep. They walk everywhere on their own, always looking for food. For her project, Ragnhild collaborates with other shepherds from northern Norway. She finishes the spun yarn in her workshop. Now I wash the yarn because it has to be clean when I dye it. When I get it from the spinning mill, I tie a thread around it so it holds together when I dye it. There is a lot of dirt in the wool, soil, but also a lot of grease. I have to wash that out. Dyeing is done with natural materials, without chemicals. These are birch leaves that I picked up here on the hillside. They are freshly put into this sieve. It's kind of like pouring a cup of tea. You put the strainer in here and boil the leaves. The Vikings are the models. It is known that they used Tansy St. John's wort and madder to dye wool. The color blue is reserved for kings because the indigo needed for dyeing is rare and expensive. Woad serves as a substitute. This is a very ancient art. We know that the Vikings did the same and that the women made beautiful textiles. These women were often accused of witchcraft because they had more knowledge about herbs, plants and their effects than the rest of the population. I think the biggest magic was when they worked with indigo. First it's yellow and then, wow, it turns blue. That is still magic today.
The blue is created by the reaction with oxygen. It looks like magic. Environmental awareness and sustainability are important topics in Norway. Regional natural products are being rediscovered, like pure wool. It is self-cleaning and keeps warm even when wet. With the advent of cotton and synthetic fibers, it has fallen into oblivion. The people here earn their money by fishing. They could not send their men out fishing without woolen clothes. On the hands, on the head and on the whole body. Without wool, they might have lasted half an hour at sea, but then they would have had problems. So wool was a basic requirement to survive here. Almost every Norwegian woman has such a sweater. Hand knitted, of course. This white sweater here is a little more feminine, but we also have some here that men like. Many men also like fresh colors, but it doesn't always have to be blue or gray. If it's orange, red, yellow, or green, many think it's great. That gives pleasure. The knitwear with the intricate patterns are part of Scandinavian folklore and are known far beyond the country's borders as Norwegian sweaters. The steep mountain slopes, so typical for Lufoten, which go right into the sea, were formed by glaciers during the last ice age. The mountains of northern Norway are among the oldest on Earth. Even in midsummer, there can be fresh snow on the glacier of Rubin, the Husky Farm's local mountain, which is a good 1,000 meters high. It's early in the morning. It is still very quiet at the Husky Farm in Inset. The sled dogs are obviously late sleepers. No reason to get up. So far, the humans haven't shown up yet. Björn Klauer and his son Morten first look after Tuna, the pregnant bitch. Hello. Look, what do we have here? They're just born. Four puppies were born during the night. That's quite a little team. The bitch and her puppies are doing well. It is Tuna's second time giving birth. She's already experienced. The beauty of these animals is that they are built in such a way that they can do everything on their own. So we as humans don't need to intervene. They're still so primitive, like wolves. They do everything on their own. They look for a place, nice and dry, protected, far away from other animals, so that they don't have to be afraid. Then they do it alone. We breed dogs only for ourselves, for our own use, because we have very special requirements for these dogs. When a new litter arrives, it's always the feeling that you have the future in front of you, that you are sure that it will continue with these dogs, that things move forward. All is well, Tuna. My sweet, I'll let you have it. Two boys and two girls. Let's see. The birth of puppies is a great moment every time, even for Björn Klauer, 
who has experienced it many times in his more than 30 years on the farm. The eyes of newborns are still closed. They open them only after about two weeks. Now, sleeping and drinking are their most important occupations. Taking care of the huskies takes up a large part of the day. Bjorn's farm is just under 40 kilometers from the nearest major town. Shopping is planned carefully. To be independent, Bjorn has learned over time to do almost everything himself. For us, summer is the time when we prepare for winter. Winter is seven months long here in the mountains. You prepare everything. First of all, the equipment that you have, the dog harnesses, the sleds. You make sure you have enough of everything in the winter. Björn Klauer grew up on the outskirts of Hamburg. Norway is the country of his dreams. I started walking in Oslo in 1984 and spent a year on foot in Norway. There I got to know what a sled dog can pull on the one hand, but also that it's great to be on the road with someone. You're no longer completely alone. And then I said to myself, if I were to gain a foothold here, then not just with one dog, but a small team. That was actually the goal. Seven months of winter with snow and ice ideal conditions to start a husky farm and offer sled tours. In the Arctic winter, the traditional way to get around. The sled dogs primarily come from the Inuit, who have used sled dogs on Greenland, northern Canada, Alaska, and also in Siberia, of course. Everywhere where there are these peoples in the Arctic. They just bred dogs that pull sleds and then just built the sleds for it. Not much has changed. You stand on the back here, on the runners. Between the runners you have the brake, so you can brake the whole team when it goes downhill, for example. And then you have a snow anchor at the back here, which you can press into the snow. Then you can also stop the team with it, hold it, so that if, for example, a dog gets tangled up in the team, I can simply go to the front and solve the problem there. Until the 1960s, Norway was one of the poorest countries in Europe. This only changed with the discovery of oil deposits off the coast. Then as now, however, fishing also was an important industry. Nusfjord was one of the most important fishing ports in Lofoten. From February to April is the peak season for cod. Fishermen from all over the country came with their boats to hunt for the fish. They were accommodated in Rohrbühr, simple wooden huts by the harbour. Fish kings bought up entire villages and controlled the trade. Their power dwindled only with the advent of steam navigation. The houses of the fishing village of Rene are scattered over several islands. Even today, stockfish is sold from here all the way to China. Salmon has been farmed in aqua farms since the 1970s. Norway produces around 1.2 million tons a year, making it the world's largest supplier. Mass farming in the sea satisfies demand, but also damages the ecosystem and leads to the long-term decline of natural fish stocks. There is not much choice of profession in Lufuten. Nap is a typical fishing village. Angelita Eriksson grew up here as the daughter of a fisherman. Her father's old harbour shed serves as quarters for the two seaweed farmers to process their kelp harvest. <laughs> Thank you.
As is so often the case, the long-established people didn't want to know about the unusual business idea of the two young women at first. Everyone thought we were crazy. <laughs> they were just like, are you crazy, seaweed? And especially my dad, you know, and he was very skeptical. Uh, but we were these two girls going out with this small boat to harvest seaweed when we first started and the fishermen were just like looking at us going, oh my god. But now, as they've seen our business grow and they see everything that we do, they have completely changed their um, attitude and um, they had this meeting and they were all standing there saying, you know, what can we do to help you guys because uh, we really believe in you and what you do and you are the future. And that really warmed my heart and I had tears in my eyes because if we can change these fishermen, then we can change the world. The two young ladies don't only have many good ideas, but also a plan. In a small store in Nap, Tamara and Angelita sell their seaweed products. And recently, they've been running a pop-up restaurant serving fresh kelp dishes. An exciting challenge for the young chef Jacek Kukielka from Poland. Seaweed can be used fresh or dried. It often is an ingredient that gives the dish a special sea-like taste. Now what I'm doing, the salad with the nori seaweed, it's the red algae. It's quite rich flavor. It's not only like saltiness, but uh, it's also umami. So it does have a bit of a like a meaty flavor, roast flavor that works like really well lifting up the flavor of the whole dish. Algae are considered the vegetable of the future. They are rich in protein and vitamins. They provide a hearty broth, are made into pesto or deep fried. Jacek lived in Japan for several years and learned the tricks of seaweed preparation. I'm originally from Poland, but I work in, around the world, like trying to develop my skills and uh, try different things and see what people are doing and eating around the world. Pickle seaweed, for example. Algae are still a niche product in European cuisine. The appeal for most restaurant diners is eating something that sounds a little gross at first, but then tastes surprisingly good. In summer, many tourists come to Lofoten including many Norwegians. In winter, it can be quite lonely here. Angelita Eriksson lived abroad for a few years before returning home. Yes, the islanders are a very special people. We are very free-spirited, we are hospitable, and I think it is important for us to stand together. It's a survival mechanism, because life here is so extreme. And then it is also very bright all day in summer and dark all winter, just like in Arctic regions. You need a good sense of humor and perseverance. We are tough, but we also have warmth of heart. And what can I say? We are free-spirited people. Björn Klauer uses the few summer months to train his huskies. A new lead dog is being looked for on the farm in Inset. 
Barras, a three-year-old male, seems promising. Last winter we had quite a few problems with deep snow and the older lead dogs were partially overwhelmed. And we're just urgently looking for a successor. Last year on a tour he already turned out quite well as just someone who goes ahead, who goes through the deep snow. Of course he's not yet disciplined and doesn't really know what it's all about and we hope to turn him into a successor for the old lead dogs. A lead dog must have fun running ahead, pulling the pack behind him, must not be afraid of snowstorms or even deep snow, must always be extremely motivated to run ahead. That's the most important thing. If he also listened to our commands, like left or right, so that we'd get where we want to go, that would also be great. The dog sense that it's about to start, and preferably all want to come along. But for a team to pull two people, Björn and Morten only need nine dogs. If one would now free them from the chain, they would immediately look where it smells like reindeer, where a moose could be. They would run away and be gone. They don't really need people, they'd feed themselves. They actually are wolves. When we harness them to the sled, it means we are going hunting as a pack. The dog team runs up to 20 kilometers per hour. Huskies are long distance runners. On winter tours, they cover a total of up to 4,000 kilometers. The lead dog leads the whole pack. Sled dogs are the only harnessed animals in the world that respond to nothing more than a call. You don't have reins, you don't have anything. You don't have a stick or anything else. You just have to tell them left or right. We speak Norwegian. We say hoir or venstre as left or right. You can't drive them. They have to want to follow. It's always about keeping the dog's motivation at the highest possible level. Pulling and doing anything together with the human must always be positive. Björn and his dogs are a team. As soon as the team approaches the farm again, they are welcomed back into the pack. He did exactly what we wanted. We had to repeat some orders, but it was good. Respect. After the work, each dog is praised personally. Nasty, my little. Come to my head. Oh, so flink, my little. And then we have the Brona here. The little Brona. It's a grass in the Und dann die Frau Kohle hier. Kommt die auch hier? Kohle. Der Rüben. I was fascinated by Norway from the very beginning. This nature that you find here, it's enormous. And it determines what you do. Nothing else determines what you do. That means when can I go out where? When can I make wood now in the summer? When can I pick berries? When can I fish? How can I prepare the next sled tour? What are the snow conditions? These are the sizes that are ruled by nature. And I can very well live with that. It gives me an inner peace and I can work wonderfully with it. From the husky farm in Inset, 
it's a good 400 kilometers south to Bordeaux. A day's journey by car, as the speed limit is 80 kilometers per hour. Here at Saltfjord, a natural wonder happens several times a day. It starts with small whirlpools in the water that get bigger and bigger. A milestrom. It occurs when huge volumes of water flow through a strait at high speed during high and low tides. Salstraumen is the largest milestrom in the world. Many legends entwine around this natural phenomenon. Dark forces and sea monsters that use the whirlpools to pull ships into the depths. The spectacle lasts a good hour. Then the water calms down again. On the coast north of Bordeaux, the realm of the white-tailed sea eagle begins. The uninhabited rocky islands are his territory. With a wingspan of up to 2.5 meters, the white-tailed sea eagle is the largest eagle in Europe. Asmund Gilset is one of the few who knows the breeding places of the birds. They built their nests high up on the bare rock islands. I have always loved nature and was especially interested in the big birds, the sea eagles. One day a strange man came to my house and asked if I could show him where the Aries were. At first I was skeptical, but then I accompanied him to the ringing and we did that together for several years. This man said, Asmund, can you take over this area, Stegen? I have such a large area to look after that I can't manage it all. Of course, I said yes. This became a 40-year friendship. Before they fledge, the young birds must be ringed. The way is arduous. Asmund and his son-in-law Gunnar are watched by the old birds. The eaglets are suspicious. Now we check whether the chick is calm. If it is restless, it could flutter out to sea and drown. So we have to be very gentle and careful. Now we go over there and Gunnar stands on the outside and watches. To calm the chick, Gunnar puts his jacket over its head. This is a ring that's used all over Europe. It's the same everywhere. They all have different numbers. The black ones are the Norwegian ones. I can see that this is a female because the bird leg is very thick. Mm -hmm. 
The ring later informs conservationists where a bird comes from and how old it is. This chick is about 11 weeks old. It cannot fly properly yet. But it will practice a lot and flap its wings. Soon it will become a fledgling. If it was stressed and nervous, it might have tried to take flight. It can flutter maybe four or five meters. For many decades, Asmund has taken care of his sea eagles. Despite his Parkinson's disease, he still visits them. Now, his son-in-law Gunnar is to take over the ringing, just as Asmund did for 40 years. I'm sure that the eagles know my boat. They know the situation and are therefore not afraid. They just sit there and watch me and surely think, can't you finally get done? Arctic summer. That means joy of life and recharging your batteries for the next winter.